All right. Thanks for watching another episode of The Creative Truth. Or if you're listening on iTunes or one of your other favorite podcasting platforms, uh, today I've uh, my friend here, Alex Nye. I've actually mentioned him in a lot of previous episodes because uh, five years ago we did a phone call like this, and that was really before podcasts were big. So he's uh, I've mentioned him in past episodes, and uh, he's a pretty interesting guy, photographer and videographer and other things based out of San Diego, California. So Alex, I guess first, uh, you want to just introduce yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's, it's great to be on. I've seen a number of these podcasts and I've been waiting for my chance to, to make a guest appearance. So this is awesome. After a few technical difficulties, but we got here. We got it. Yeah. We figured it out. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Alex Nye. I, We'll give you the quick intro and we maybe can get into more nuance later, but I'm a fine art and architectural photographer as well as videographer. So I own a production company called Prismedia LLC and we do photo video for primarily uh, in the architectural industry, but uh, as I mentioned before, also in the fine art uh, industry as well. Cool. And, uh, the, the way we know each other, we're, we're actually some of our oldest childhood friends. We, we both grew up uh, outside of Albany, New York, and then uh, we kind of went different ways because I moved away when around the in the year 2001, and then we both went into um, basically videography, and so that's kind of been cool because it keeps us like connected in that way. So do you want do you mind giving us a little background on uh, where you are now and on kind of the steps that that you had to take to get you to where you are? Oh, man. <laughs> it's a long yeah, road. This goes, it's a long road for sure. And yeah, it's I love I love our history. It, it's so cool. Making silly backyard videos together. Uh, little did we know that we would both end up being media professionals. <laughs> so that's pretty awesome. But yeah, I mean, where to begin? So as, as you know, we just alluded to Tyler and I both used to, we're always, you know, kind of the kids with the cameras back in our younger days. Um, that I feel like is, is a common story for a lot of photographers. You know, you pick up a camera at a young age, but we used to make silly skits and, you know, we had the mini DV cameras shooting skateboarding, shooting uh, highlight reels for athletes in college. I got into, uh, shooting some music videos for um, maybe some, we'll say subpar white white rappers, <laughs> and uh, that was a fun fun journey because you know it kind of gave myself some creative expression in high school and and a creative outlet to create videos, uh, and you know as with a lot of video people that you know people started to notice what you do and you get other opportunities so you know, parents would hi uh, hire me for, uh, to make highlight reels of, you know, high school senior athletes to submit to colleges. And soon after that, um, I got involved in the wedding industry. And so I shot a few wedding videos for, at first it was all for friends, uh, or, you know, friends of friends, etc. And, uh, so there was a clear, um, passion for, cameras photography and video i but i didn't really know what to do with that uh out of high school and at first you know i was considering going to a film school i'm kind of glad i didn't though which is a whole nother long story we can get into but ultimately where i landed myself in college was in a very general field of visual arts uh and i'm very happy with how it turned out because basically I went to SUNY New Paltz, which is, you know, hour and a half north of New York City. And it's a small art school, primarily art focused. Um, but the visual arts major allowed me to really explore and experiment different uh, disciplines and different creative paths. So I, you know, a lot of people that go to school, uh, to an art school, you know, you, you're going for a BFA, you kind of are hyper-focused on one thing. Like I had friends that all they did was painting, all they did was graphic design, all you did was, you know, photography, whatever. But with my very broad field, I was able to 
uh, kind of experiment with different classes. So I took sculpture, printmaking, 3D modeling, filmmaking, photography, all sorts of different things. The list goes on. And that was an amazing experience because I, you know, it just gave me a chance to kind of explore all different realms of, of the creative world uh, and, and discover passions of mine. So during that process, I took a, photog a few photography classes. Um, that's when I started borrowing uh, a Nikon DSLR from my older brother long exposures and panoramas and all sorts of uh, things that I do very extensively today. But uh, pretty much, you know, I just, I knew I had a, a love for cameras, but now through that process in college, I discovered my love for still photography. Prior to that, it was mostly just video. Um, and so very quickly kind of discovered not only a passion for it, but sort of a natural uh, ability for it and a natural understanding of Photoshop and uh, you know as I mentioned some some compositing and and blending exposures and panoramas so that was amazing um, and you know I don't know how much how deep I should get into all this I'll let you let you kind of chime in before I go too much further but but so that's you know that's everything up to uh, up to college yeah uh, and then uh, and then kind of uh walk us all also through the steps of after you finished college you you let you left new york and then uh you lived in santa barbara and now uh how did that kind of progression happen yeah so towards the end of college um so my school really was you know compared to a lot of other uh production or schools where people study film and video it was much different because it was more focused on the fine art side of photography instead of the commercial side, uh, which at the time I actually didn't like. I kind of wish it was more like technical based and, and more like strategy. And here's like, you know, how to create a business and how to market yourself. But it wasn't any of that. It was all like, oh, what's your, you know, what's your concept? What's your message? What's your you know, your, your, the story you're telling with your work. And so anyway, my school kind of trained me uh, or positioned me to promote myself in the fine art world. And so towards the end of college, I was applying to gallery shows in Albany, New York, which was, you know, my, our home, my hometown or the nearest city to my hometown. And so I'd had, you know, a number of gallery shows. I sold my first print while still in college and, and this like light bulb went off and I was like, wow, like this is a, this is an avenue. Like people are, you know, willing to pay money uh, for artwork. And, and that's, and it was just, just like this amazing moment when I was like, wow, you know, I, this is what I need to be doing. Um, well, I want to so just I, jump in for one second really quick. Please there. do. Yeah. Um, the, uh, so that's part of this, part of the goal of this podcast is uh, it's called the creative truth and it's basically the truth behind how to survive or make it as an artist or, or as a creative professional, because it sounds great to just make art and get paid and live and buy a house and, you know, all the, all the traditional things. But a lot of times the schools are teaching you just how to be an artist and to create, you know, the specific medium, but they're not teaching you all the things like taxes and health insurance and, and just basic accounting and finding clients and, uh, and closing sales and invoicing and all the, all the stuff that you have to know. Um, so that's kind of where I'm trying to fill in the gap is when other people that want to get into fine art photography, print selling, architectural photography, all the things that you're doing, they can kind of listen um, and kind of gain from your experience and, and the, and the mistakes you made early on. So that's, that's exactly what the point of this podcast is, is to kind cool. of fill in the gaps there. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And it, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, unfortunately like school, most school, it, at least in my experience, they, it doesn't really like prepare you for all those things. Like they usually kind of take a, a certain focus. It's like either this is very technical or this is very like conceptual. Uh, but yeah, a lot of times they leave out that. So I'd be lying if I said, you know, I didn't have to figure a lot of that out on my own. 
Um, you know, so I, I dedicated tons of time outside of school, uh, you know, my own free time to doing that kind of research, doing studying, watching YouTube videos, uh, just like this, you know, conversations with, with established pros and just kind of picking up little things along the way. So um, it's been quite the learning process for sure. Uh, but yeah, happy to, happy to kind of share anything I've learned throughout the process. Yeah. So you, so you, uh, you sold your first print in school and then, uh, and then you realize that, oh, okay, this is something I can actually make a living at. Um, and then one thing I, I think is really pretty unique and pretty cool about you is that you've always been independent, uh, and doing it your own way rather than finishing up school and, and finding, you know, finding a stable job. So, uh, how did that basically, you know, progress? Yeah. Um, well, again, it, it's hard to know where to start, but we'll kind of continue the story. So, um, after college, I, I knew that I wanted to go somewhere that had more opportunity that, you know, my industry was thriving and there was a lot going on. And so naturally California, Southern California, Los Angeles came to mind. I had sort of mentioned that idea, but the truth is I never would have done something that bold by myself. Uh, but luckily my girlfriend at the time who I've been with since, since high school, uh, you know, we went to nearby colleges. She, you know, kind of took notice of, of me saying that, saying that I want to go out West and she kind of took initiative to begin looking for grad school. So she's in, she's a scientist, you know, we got the art and science going. So she's sort of the under, other end of the spectrum, but, uh, you know, she knew she was going applying for grad schools and so she chose a bunch on the in california she applied to uc davis uc santa barbara uh and a few others out here and which is funny because if it weren't for her kind of taking that initiative i probably wouldn't have done something so bold as to just you know fly across the country and start a new life um so a lot of credit to aaron uh now my fiance for for that and so, yeah, we, we packed up the car and kind of just made a bold move to transfer everything we had. Um, so long story short, she, she got accepted to UC Santa Barbara, uh, which I really knew nothing about, but I knew it was in SoCal and it was beautiful. So we moved to Santa Barbara. She, you know, began uh, her five-year journey in grad school, which gave me like a good amount of time to kind of start fresh start kind of start from scratch just start putting myself out there um and just create a a business and a, a name for myself in out here in california and i it definitely wasn't a quick process like it was it was a slow and steady thing i would say the first few years was more personal development and cuz i you know you know me my i am like such a perfectionist with everything i do and and i like kind of set my standards very high which you know, basically means that I, uh, I wait to really promote myself uh, until I feel like I'm fully ready. And I, I feel like I really can handle high level work that I deserve. Now, don't get me wrong, I did a bunch of uh, side gigs in between. So, you know, I, I found a, a sort of production company in where I could shoot weddings, but not have any other part in them. I didn't have to do, you know, the, the marketing to find clients. I didn't have to, to edit. So that actually was a great way at the beginning for me to, um, have a decent stable income, do photography and, and make money from it, but also have extra time to kind of develop, um, you know, the other aspects of my business behind the scenes. And, you know, that meant, Specifically, that was that was architecture. So yeah, I'm trying not to jump around too much because there are a lot of layers to this. And I don't know what's like the most the most like potent and relevant information. But um, soon after living in Santa Barbara, I a few, th you know, I, I just started putting myself out there. I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that people should get from from what I'm all saying is like, 
you know, really important to don't just hide in a cave. Like, yes, you want to, you really want to develop your own skills. So that's super important. Like, obviously, you know, I watched a ton of YouTube videos. Like I learned a bunch of new software uh, just from the internet, totally for free. So you don't need to go to school. You can, you can easily learn this stuff and, and really become a master. Just dedicate yourself to it and, and have a passion for it. But beyond that, you also can't forget about um, socializing. Now, obviously, that method is a little different now because of COVID and, and that's all different. So this doesn't directly apply. But at the time, you know, I was basically just, you know, doing research for every gallery in my in my city. And I had a map and I had all their information, kind of what they specialize in, all the pr uh, all the print and framing shops. And through that process, I, I just kind of started visiting businesses that were relevant to my industry. Um, I met a, f a framer who, you know, was going to help me create like um, a, an inventory for, for out there so I could start show uh, having shows in Santa Barbara. And that it's, it's so it's so interesting. I, I could go really deep on this one story, but uh, just just surface level. It, it's just very interesting to look back on that and how much came from that one interaction. Like I, I ended up branching a little bit further out of Santa Barbara into a town, a neighboring town called Carpinteria. And I met this guy who, you know, a little bit older, but ran a, a frame shop. And yeah, we, we, we want to hear, we want to hear the story for sure. Okay. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So, you know, basically this guy, uh, I just, you know, I just started kind of exploring my city and, and making connections. And this guy, we just immediately had this connection. So his name is Mikey or it's, it's Michael, but I call him Mikey. He's like 60, 65 year old dude. And we just, we just clicked like right away. And, you know, he, I brought in some prints of mine and, you know, it was, this was the beginning of my, my 4d work as we can get into later. Um, but, you know, he saw a couple prints and he was just like, immediately he just fell in love he's like wow this is just unlike anything i've seen and he immediately just took a a liking to me in a way that he he wanted to do anything he could to like help me succeed and and help make me make connections so this was probably my first year in living in in california in santa barbara and he you know this guy was an artist himself but he's also involved in the art community and so he gave me, you know, he connected me with a lot of different um, established photographers and, and other artists and, and galleries as well. Um, so, you know, through that, I met a person that I did a little internship with an established professional photographer, Patricia Clark. Um, uh, he connected me with, uh, you know, a few local uh, like cafes and galleries that I ended up showing having solo shows in. So without going, you know, too, too deep, that experience was so valuable that that really uh, got my foot in the door in Santa Barbara. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed, like things branch out, you start to meet a couple people, you start to put yourself out there. So it's so important to just, you know, get out in your community, just kind of show people, show people what you're all about, what you do. And you'll kind of find your tribe, you know, you'll find people that that like and support what you do because, you know, people are, for the most part, people are, do want to help other people. You know, they, they, when they see potential, they want to like support that and, and help make that thrive in whatever way they can. So that was, that was amazing. Um, another way we, I kind of put myself out there was, <laughs> it sounds silly. It sounds like really silly now, but um, I, so I actually, I met, well, actually through, so through that framer, I met another guy named Joss, who is a filmmaker. Joss and I, you know, wanted to make some films just for fun, like for YouTube or whatever. And it started out nothing too serious. He actually put out a, a, a call on Craigslist to, to kind of network with other filmmakers in the area. We got a couple hits. We ended up meeting with a few guys um and that was that was the beginning of Prism media actually so we that started as just like a group of three or four 
uh, young, passionate filmmakers who weren't really established yet, but we we all you know had had motivation and drive to to make something happen. And at first, it was just going to be you know fun, goofy skits for YouTube or just you know short films or just something that was a more passion projects. Um, but once we kind of combined our forces and uh, you know brought our creative you know, elements together and our, our kits and gear together, you know, we realized that this could really be more of a business. So that's when, uh, we decided, and, and at that point, one person had dropped out. So as a group of three, we decided to start uh, a production company. And so that's where, <laughs> again, this is a very long story. I could go into the, you know, the, the naming of it. There's, there's been a lot of drama <laughs> with the whole thing, but, um, basically we, you know, in the end, we started a, a company and began, you know, same, same as I said before, just started putting ourselves out there, uh, doing community events and networking and going to like shared workspaces uh, where other, you know, business owners kind of existed and networked and started working in the community. So we got um, a surprising amount of work, surprisingly fast. And I think that was one one actual disadvantage of, of our situation is that we were we didn't even like have a bank account set up yet. We weren't ready to like we were getting checks written to Prism Media that we couldn't even cash yet. So we kind of like got a little ahead of ourselves, um, which I guess is a good problem. But you know, we that that also led to a few um, issues within the company of like, okay, maybe we're moving too fast. Let's let's slow this down and and uh, and whatnot. But so that goes really deep, but I'll, I'll let you kind of react before I spill a lot more. Well, so what I'm curious about is, uh, if you don't mind, um, you, you, you're you like me, you do a lot of different things. So I'm, mm-hmm. if you're willing to share, could you break down of like a pie chart, 100% of your, of your livable income? What percentage of that is prints what percentage is architectural photography what's what's commissioned video work kind of break that down Mm -hmm. for us yeah yeah great question um so i actually i was just looking into this last night it's funny you say that because we're wrapping up the year you know we're getting ready to do do taxes kind of evaluating 2020 and, and how everything is going um this wasn't always the case but but currently the the breakdown is is pretty evenly split between, well, okay, let me back up. So one one thing I should mention, as much as uh, I've, I love the fine art side of what I do and I've poured so much time and energy into it, um, it's definitely the hardest way to make money. So I don't want people to get the wrong idea and think, oh, you know, selling prints and and, uh, you know, showing in galleries is, is, is super easy. And it's like, there's a ton of money in it. That's a difficult way to make a living. And, and you know, think I think I always relate it to like musicians, right? You know, you can get paid to do gigs, but that's, that's kind of the equivalent of like commissioned work. And, but to actually like make songs that blow up and people pay money for and, and that supports your career, that's pretty challenging. So that's kind of like how, you know, a comparison I use. So with that said... Um, I, it's not a a huge percentage. So that is probably 10, 10 to 15% of my total income is from fine art, uh, from selling prints. Um, the other 90, 85, 90% is from, is mostly from commissioned work. So, and, and there's a whole story that maybe we can get into, which is like, when the light bulb went off that like I should make a transition from fine art to commercial, specifically architecture. There was, there was like kind of a few specific moments that that, that light bulb went off and I was like, this is perfect. This is exactly what I should be, should be focusing my energy on and and what I like am naturally good at. Um, So maybe we can get into that, but to answer your question uh, now, it really splits into three, let's see, three or four, I'd say four main categories. There's, there's video production, which, uh, that, that also can be divided into architectural 
subject matter and then not non-architectural mostly these days it, it's more and more architectural every once in a while i'll do like a more you know corporate style video or like uh you know talking head or presentation or something like that that's more rare but uh so that's about one third of what's remaining so maybe 30 percent 30 35 percent of my total income is is video production um the rest is photography so that leaves 60 you know, 50, 60% is photography, but within photography, there's also subcategories. So I'd say the, the majority of my income is from commissioned architectural photography. So that's, you know, my clients include um, construction companies, architecture firms, engineering firms, and, and things of that nature. And so basically they will hire me, you know, once a building is completed, because you know buildings are a long process there's a lot of people involved there's multiple years of construction and then they want to show it off uh once it's all done and so they they will come to me to take the like the beauty shots is is kind of what we call it the hero shots of the building of a completed building and it's pretty time sensitive too because they want it you know once everything's done the landscaping looks pristine the you know everything's installed but before the actual tenant moves in. So there's like a short window uh, where, where I can get in and photograph it. Um, so that is probably the largest percentage of my, my income, which is, you know, probably about 50, 50 plus percent. Now, what's interesting is, and <laughs> if I'm, if I'm a little scattered, I, I apologize because there's a lot of like nuance to all this, but the, uh, to go along with that, and, and one thing that's really interesting about this industry in particular, and what really, um, you know, I think draws me in and, and allows me to snowball within this industry is that in the architectural building industry, with any given project, there are so many parties involved. So you might be hired by, I might be hired by the construction company, and, and this has happened a few times. So, uh, so that's one client that you know is paying to commission me to create photos of a project but for any given building you're gonna have like three to six or even more different uh entities that are also potentially interested in using those same photos that you create so you have like mentioned before the architect the structural engineer the mep engineer the lighting designer the landscape designer so that's what's really interesting about this industry is it's kind of like a built-in snowball effect. So I'll get hired by one client, create work for them. And then the other parties involved in that building, you know, in that project will take notice and they'll say, Oh, you know, these photos are great. We want to use these to show off this project on our website. And so that's where um, a, a small but additional part of my income is from licensing. And so licensing is something that I, it took me a long time to, uh, to really understand and like fully wrap my head around. And it actually took a lot of like convincing myself that it was like a real thing and that it was fair. Cause like when you first hear about licensing or, or first dabble with it, it, it feels kind of wrong. It's like, well, I did already get hired to, you know, to make this work. So should I just give it away to everyone else? But like the answer is no, because you know, you got to think of it like any other, any, any, any other, um, like intellectual property. So think of it as, you know, going back to the music example, um, you pay 99 cents for a song on iTunes. You personally can use that, but you can't just give it away to everybody else and like say, Oh, now everyone can have it. Or, you know, same with software, you know, you, you, you pay, um, a license per computer at the office that it's being used on if you're at a big firm or whatever. Um, so anyway, we can get into that more, but, but licensing is something that I feel like really is so important for photographers to have a deep understanding of um, and really utilize uh, to, to help yourself grow because it, it might seem weird and awkward at first, but it, it's a hundred percent like, the way it should be done. Uh, and it's like the fair and normal standard practice in the industry. So anyway, the reason I bring that up is because, you know, there's the commission work, which is maybe 50%. 
But then there's like an additional 10, 15 percent, uh, if not maybe even more of like once the work is already done, then I can start doing my homework and saying, OK, who else was involved in this this project who who might have a use for these images? And so I'll you know do a bunch of research. Uh, sometimes I'll put my intern to task to do it. Uh, but you're basically, you know, doing, uh, you know, a bunch of Googling, finding out what the companies are within those companies, who the marketing person is, you know, finding them on LinkedIn, figuring out their email, sending emails all around or making cold calls and just saying, hey, you know, here's some work I produced. Um, would you guys be interested in, in licensing these photos? And sometimes they say, no, we're good. We already have photos. Um, but then, you know, every, every, pretty often they'll, they'll say, yeah, these are great. You know, it's, and it's easier for them to just license at a flat rate per photo instead of going out and, ha and hiring another pro to shoot the whole project over again. Um, and then with that <clears throat> is what I was saying before is like the natural snowball effect. So you do a project for one client and then you, through that process, you meet two or three other clients or potential clients. And then if they like what you did, then they'll, they will consider you for, for their next photo shoot. Um, so that's why it's so important to not half-ass anything. I mean, I, that's not really my style in general, but, um, you know, it, it's, that's why it's so important to really knock every job out of the park because you don't, you never know who else is going to take notice and, and be drawn in, uh, to actually working with you and, and wanting to, to hire you in the future. So yeah, I just shot a house uh, uh, for because I do more uh, residential real estate rather than commercial architectural photography, and um, it, they just finished a house, and I'm like, you know what? Now that you say that, like the builder probably would be interested in seeing photos of the house that they just finished because they probably didn't hire a photographer to come in there. So, so now when I'm on the job, I'm gonna like see if there's a a billboard or something up saying who's building that neighborhood. So that's a great idea, dude. Absolutely, man. I, we really, we really should dive into this. Cause like, yeah, you, there's photographers leave a lot on the table that, that could be taken advantage of. Um, and, and that's, and I, I did too, you know, when I was starting out, like I didn't, I didn't fully understand, you know, how, how you could utilize the assets that we create because, you know, what we, we are creating value inherently creating value. And like you said, almost every building project, there is like, uh, you know, a sort of summary board. A lot of times it says who the architect is, who the builder is and all that. So every time, you know, even just driving through my neighborhood, I, I just take notice to these things. Like anytime I see construction, I'll pull over, I'll snap a photo of the building or snap a photo of, of the board and then just log like a mental note or sometimes a physical note of that project when it's when is it expected to be finished and and so I'll, I'll kind of have my eye on it and and just go there on my own free time and photograph it what's called like on spec shooting on spec uh speculation so that i've actually done a number of times and and <laughs> this is like this is kind of a i don't i don't say this much this is, so this we're revealing some some big truths here some big secrets but uh that's actually how i i kind of initially broke through because What's really hard is going from nothing and and not really having any professional commission work to show for yourself and trying to get companies to hire you on a whim and just saying, hey, you know, like, come hire me for for high end photography. But like if they don't see that you've been hired before, then it's very challenging. So my strategy was to shoot like I was saying, shoot on spec. So I would just find, you know, any building near me. Um, that was like either recently completed or about to be completed. And then I would just go there for a few days, you know, sunrise and sunset, twilight, golden hour, all that good stuff. Just make the best photos I possibly could. Uh, and then just, like I said before, share it with the marketing team from those companies. Um, obviously there was a, you know, that, that didn't work all the time, maybe more than it, uh, more often than it did work. But all you need is a couple of times for that, for that to work. Um, not only are you you're generating a little bit of income from the licensing, but also you're getting your name out there. You're introducing yourself to those, those companies. Um, so you're also getting practice in something that isn't commissioned too. Exactly. You're getting practice. And so that's the biggest thing is like, 
when I was first starting, you need, you need your website to look like you've been doing this professionally. Like a client will sniff out like, a, a, I don't I don't want to say, I don't know if it's right to say a fake or, or whatever, cause it's not necessarily a fake, but they'll, they'll notice, you know, if you're, what's the best way to put this? Like spreading yourself too thin. So I, one of the biggest mistakes I noticed with beginner photographers, and I made the same mistake, is trying to put everything uh, on your website, trying to really show that you do it all. It's great to be a jack of all trades, and I like to think of myself that way. But as far as how you present yourself, I think it's really important to be focused on your website. Like if you want to do weddings and you also want to do shoot architecture or real estate or whatever, that's fine, but just have different websites for it. You know, don't, Great don't advice. put it on the, don't put it on the same website, like have totally different brands, totally different identities. So those, you know, each of those clients don't see the other thing. Cause if, you know, if a high end architect comes along to your website and they see, you know, some wedding portraits, like there you lost them you lost them and, and it's like that took me a while to like really appreciate that I mean I'm even dealing with this now with my fine artwork like this is now a question that I keep coming back to like I've 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 kind of thinned things out I've really refined my focus so much but I still do fine art and architecture now there is a little bit of overlap with those but you know I I can't help but wonder it, would it make sense for me to, to kind of create two different sites, like the, the commercial and the fine art, but that's a whole other story. That's sort of a personal, <laughs> personal thing that I'm, I'm debating about recently. So one of the best success stories for your licensing, uh, it, tell us about the Audi. Was it Audi that, that commissioned you? Uh, Lexus. A Lexus. Lexus. Okay. Tell us that yeah. story. Gladly. Oh man. Um, so yeah, that, that was a, definitely a career highlight. And what's interesting about that is that there's no way that I could have predicted that or seen that coming. Um, like there's literally no way that just came, completely came out of the blue. So basically one of my fine art pieces, so, so little tiny bit of background, you know, I do um, in my fine art, I do what I, you know, I, I have a technique I call 4D, 4D being a reference to the fourth dimension or the dimension of time. So basically in one photo, uh, I kind of stay at a location or recreate a photo at the same location at different times of day, different times of year, whatever it is, and then kind of blend those elements together. So uh, that's just sort of something that I've been developing and working on for a long time. So I had one photo that was of a uh, it was like a, a super blood moon or some rare eclipse that was happening. And so, you know, I went out like one in the morning until like 10 AM, uh, shooting with a couple other people who we went up to a mountaintop. So this was like, just totally for, for the love of it. I mean, maybe I'll sell some prints from it, but, but it wasn't like, you know, I thought this was going to be some big break, but anyway, so I, I created, uh, a bunch of photos that, that night, but, there was one photo in particular that came out really well. It's a time slice. So you have these vertical slices as the sun's rising, as the moon is setting. So really interesting image. Um, but I, and, and so, you know, I, I, I sold a few prints of it. I put it on my website in a few different places. And then I kind of forgot about it. Um, two years later, I think it was about two years later, I just get an email randomly from someone from a, a marketing agency in Canada and they said, Hey, we came across your photo. Uh, our client is Lexus and they're doing like a big ad campaign here in Canada. And they would like to use this photo as part of their ad campaign. Um, and so I was like, wow, that's, that's amazing. And so I asked for more details. You know, they, they basically described the, um, that it would end up being on billboards and some bus stops uh, pretty much throughout Canada. So a bunch of different copies. And so I, uh, so here's where, where it gets tricky because depending where you are in your career, people would handle this situation differently. Like if I, and I feel like 
I'm kind of glad that it happened a little bit later because, you know, I've, I've learned about licensing by this point. If this were to happen two years prior or, or a few years, you know, before it did, when I was, you know, starting out and, and didn't really understand the value in these types of things, I probably would have underbid completely. I probably would have given them some price where it's like, well, you know, this, because here's the challenge as a photographer, you, you know, you see an opportunity like this and you, you obviously don't want it to miss out on that opportunity. It's like, wow, you know, even just having uh, one of my photos, you know, on billboards for, for a huge brand like Lexus has got to be, you know, a big, uh, like way to get your name out there, get your work out there. So it's like, well, I don't want to screw this up. I don't want to ask for too much and then scare them off. Um, so that thought definitely went through my head. And I feel like if I were early in my career, I would have asked for a lot less. But the first thing I did is I went to Getty Image Licensing Calculator. So write that down if you ever have to um, d calculate industry standard licensing rates. And so that's a great place to start. There's a few. I'll put it in the description. Yeah, please do. There's a few things like that, but Getty is a pretty industry standard way to kind of calculate what what these things are worth. And so, you know, within this calculator, you basically put all the variables. So you say, you know, what's the distribution? You know, is it nationwide? Is it worldwide? How long will it be? Is What are the terms? Is it a year? Is it six months, et cetera? Um, how large it's going to show up in a publication. So this works for, you know, magazine publications, for paid advertisements, um, local advertising, whatever it is. Um, and so it'll, you kind of put in these variables and it'll spit out a number and say, hey, this is like the industry standard rate for what they're asking for. Um, and now, to be fair, I feel like I'm always surprised when I when I do this and, and see what number they come out. Almost every time, the number is way higher than I than I thought it would be. Um, so you can even reference to that. You can even, you know, if you want, and if your client gives you any pushback, you can even screenshot this image calculator and say, "Hey, this is like the industry standard rate right here." Yeah, um, I'm not making it. I'm not just making a number up. This is actually exact. researched and documented. Yeah. Right. Sure. Exactly. You know, this, mm -hmm. there's, there is a standard and like, I didn't even know there was such thing as like a standard, you know, licensing rate or for everything. So anyway, um, I ended up asking for, maybe I won't, I won't disclose the exact number, but, uh, a pretty substantial number. Um, and it, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. I was, I was pretty scared that it wasn't that it was going to scare them off. Um, Do you want to give people a range, either like a number of zeros or something like that? Uh, five figures. Okay. Five figures. Great. For yeah. one image that you took on, not on spec, just a fine art image. Yeah. So one other quick thing I should notice or note, because here's another thing that these companies try to do to, to, to kind of like evaluate how much you know or how, how much of a professional you are. I've gotten a few of these requests. Like someone finds a photo, it happens to fit with what, you know, what advertising campaign they want to do. The Lexus example, that was the largest, um, the largest example that I've encountered. But like it's happened on smaller occasions like um, UC Santa Barbara, you know, found one of my photos and licensed it. Um, like a, a private jet company in Santa Barbara found an, an aerial drone photo of mine and they ended up using it. So those are a few examples, but so here's like a, a kind of warning or something to look out for as, as a photographer. These people, they know what they're doing. They know that they should be paying money for this stuff and that using a photo in a commercial application or for advertising has value. Like they should be paying for that. But they will purposefully play dumb. And so when they, in order to gauge how much you know as a photographer. So this happens every single time. The first email is always very like, like kind of like casual. Like they try to play cool, like, oh, hey, you know, like we found this photo and like, 
we thought it'd be kind of cool to use it. Like, do, do you mind, like, do you mind giving us permission for that? And they'll say it kind of casually where like all they need is a yes. Uh, and then they're like, okay, thanks. And like, you know, this will be great exposure. And, and so that is their way of kind of filtering out pros from amateurs. And so they, and unfortunately the amateurs will, will kind of fall for that. And I, I have, you know, early on in my career, which is like, you're just excited for somebody to want to use your photo for something big. And it's like, Oh, cool. Great exposure. You know, put this on the resume. Great. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm down for that. And so, but what's funny is their tone immediately changes based on how you react. So their first, their first message is always very casual. It's like, Oh, Hey, can we use this? And I'm like, and so basically you want to, the way you want to respond is as a pro say, Hey, you know, great. Well, we're really glad that, you know, you you found this photo and it fits for what you need. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Um, you know, I'd love to discuss uh, licensing options with you. Now, these are the questions that I kind of need clarification on. And that's when you have to ask like, okay, what, you know, what's the distribution? Uh, you know, how large will it be printed? How long, et cetera, the things I listed before. And so immediately, once they hear that, their tone will change because they'll, they'll say, okay, we tried to get this for free. But now we realize, okay, we're working with a pro and then they'll, they'll spill all that information. So they're never going to give you that right off the bat, but then they'll say, but they have it. They know exactly how many issues are printed, how many, this or that for these big, big ad campaigns. And so it's it just, that's like a, a warning for, for anyone that gets an email like that. Like they're going to try to take advantage of you at first. So that's why you just got to play it cool, you know, be respectful and, and just respectfully say, Hey, you know, this is how it's going to work. Um, and they'll, they'll start treating you like a professional. So um, with this occasion, I, we were dealing with Canadian dollars. And so the initial bid that I gave them was, was out of their budget. And so, you know, it was pretty high. I'm not going to lie. It was pretty high. I, I would have been surprised if they took it, but they, they basically, you know, cut some off the top and said, you know, and, and that's when they became totally transparent. You know, once I gave them a high number, they're like, you know, sorry, like, so we'll tell you, this is our budget, you know, we can only pay X. Um, and uh, usually that's, that's pretty true. Um, they might, you know, they might mess with you a little bit and say it's lower, but, but it would be kind of awkward for them to, to say, here's our budget. And then, you know, be like, okay, we could stretch it a little bit. So I, I knew that was pretty, it seemed pretty honest. So, you know, I, I pretended to think about it. I was like, okay, let me think about this just to like, keep them in suspense, gave it like a couple days and then came back and was like, okay, you know, I guess I could do that because from my perspective, like I'm clearly not going to get much more. It's not what I wanted to get to begin with, but it's still a, a, a solid chunk of money for something that, um, you know, was already completed. It, I had already done the work. Well, mostly another story behind that, but um so yeah uh would you and ended up would you sorry, consider walking now would you actually walk away from a deal if they undercut you too bad or you thought they were being dishonest if it was if it was pretty substantial from my original request then totally I, and i've done it before um and honestly at first it's a pretty crappy feeling to lose jobs because you know you're too expensive it's like oh man i should have I should have asked for less or, oh, you know, I should have been more flexible. But when you're, when you're new and like every job is important and you need the income, then like, I get that. And I, I I've had that feeling, but once you are a little more established and you can afford to lose a couple jobs, man, it's a, it's an empowering feeling to, to tell your rate very confidently and very matter of fact, and then, you know, they just, they can't afford it. And, and that's totally fine. And, you know, there's, it doesn't have to be awkward. You just say, you know, this, I, I, you know, I appreciate you reaching out. I'm glad you like my work, but unfortunately it's just, I'm not the right fit for this particular project. And then more, more often than not, what that does is that signals to them and establishes in their mind that you are the high end option. So it's like, hey, you know, there's plenty of people that'll do it for less and that's fine. You know, I, I encourage you to, to do that. I can give you some recommendations. That's totally fine. And, you know, you don't have to be defensive about it, um, but that subconsciously 
you know, plants that seed in their mind, like, okay, this is the high end guy. So that when they do have a higher budget, you're the one that they're going to call. They say, okay, now we can afford to hire this guy. And so not only are you going to, you know, will you be making more money, but also um, most likely those higher budget projects are the ones that are more interesting. You know, they're the cooler buildings, the cooler projects. Um, so, and, and it definitely takes time to get to that point. Like I, you know, there was a time when I, I was stoked to get any kind of job, like not even that long ago, like a couple of years ago, um, I would have taken like anything, you know, for, for whatever. Um, so I, I'm super grateful to, to be in a place where I can, you know, I can be um, very secure and confident in, in what my rates are. And, you know, if, if a client can't afford that, then no, you know, no hard feelings. Cool. So one thing I want to also say to you too, is that um, we, I've heard a lot of these stories from you already. And um, so I know that there's a lot more we could cover and we could go, we could deep dive on inter intellectual property or photography or architectural or whatever, but I plan on having you back on as a guest. And so I want to actually make this an opportunity. If you are listening to this or watching on YouTube and you have a question for Alex, or you want him to kind of elaborate in one particular area, um, drop it below. You can either, uh, you can leave it as a comment or you can email me at wecreatetruth at gmail.com or you can actually go to creative-truth.com and uh, submit to the form there. And I will, uh, the next time I have Alex on, we'll try and address some of those questions. Um, so we, uh, we are also coming up on uh, around an hour. So what I would like to do is ask you one more question and then I'll uh, basically close out. And, and uh, yeah, we'll, I'll have you back on uh, later this year. This episode is dropping on February 9th. So Tuesday, February 9th is when this will come out. So later in the year, I'll have you and uh, hopefully we get some questions and we can, we can focus on one of these areas and kind of dive deeper because this has already been like super, super helpful. Um, I've learned a lot and um, I'm sure people have too. So my last question for you is but for, for young people, for, for Alex's and Tyler's that are 17, 18, they're just out of high school, or maybe they're about to finish high school, they're thinking about going to college, maybe they're in college, and they want to get their feet wet, they want to start making some money. Um, what are some, a couple pieces of advice or some things you would have done differently, or you would have reached a conclusion faster to kind of fast track that career path? Do you think, um, do you think college is needed? Um, I know we've kind of touched on that a little bit. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you're good. It's it's kind of a it's kind of a multi layered question, but the yeah. other the main takeaway is we want to help other people get to where we're at and uh, mm -hmm. speed them along. Yeah. No. Absolutely. I mean, I'd say a few things. Like, so first of all, regarding college, I think that I think that depends on your personality. To be honest, I feel like there it depends on your personality type and how driven you are. Um, for me at that point in life, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Like, and I, I knew I had, you know, interest in art, drawing, graffiti, graphic design, photography, all that stuff, but I didn't know specifically like where to go with that. So for me, college was super valuable in order to kind of discover, you know, try different things, discover which one best fit me. Um, and then, and then kind of take off from there. And, and, you know, through that process, of course, you know, I learned a lot of technical things, but I, I mean, if I knew beforehand that I didn't, uh, if I knew beforehand that I knew photography was kind of my direction, I, I would say I definitely could have done what I did without college. Like, I think it's, you're so capable at this point, you know, in, in 2020, there's like insane of amounts of information on the internet. Um, some free some you pay a small amount for but compared to college it's pretty darn pretty darn reasonable um so i think that depends on your personality type i think the biggest thing the biggest like factor that determines whether you're going to be successful is how much you love it and how driven and dedicated you are and so that's the biggest thing before you like you know, commit to something, just make sure it's something that you really enjoy. Because if you, you know, if you don't enjoy it, 
you're not going to put in those long, hard hours, late nights. Like I've put in insane amount of all nighters. You know, I went nocturnal for, for a couple of years, just, uh, just, you know, working my butt off and, and just developing my own craft. And so that, that's where a lot of the, you know, the technical skill came from for me is just, you know, the, the pure love for what I was doing. And every, you know, every time I would create a new piece of work or photo or video, you know, I was like amazed at like, you know, what I made and, it, and that's such a cool feeling. So make sure you have that fire. That's the most important thing. Make sure you're really fired up about what you're doing. And that way it doesn't feel like work. You know, that's the most important thing because it, it shouldn't, you know, it should feel like fun. It should feel like, I mean, obviously it is hard work, but you, it should feel like something that you enjoy doing. Um, so that's obviously most important. I already, as I already kind of mentioned, putting yourself out there. Um, just to quickly go back to the Lexix example, uh, that only happened because I, I put this photo in a bunch of different locations. You know, it was on my print store, it was on Instagram, it's on uh, whatever other, other photo platforms there are. And uh, obviously also very important to keyword. So uh, I, I must have like put in the title time slice or, you know, time lapse or something like that because that's the only reason that that client found it is because they, they were probably typing, you know, time slice or time blend or whatever. And so, you know, it happened to fit what they were searching for. So, and that's another example of putting yourself out there. So it's not just physically, socially and networking. It's also your work. So just be on as many platforms as you can be, you know, be on YouTube, be on Instagram and, and, uh, 500px or, or whatever all those, those channels are, um, you know, don't, you, you gotta, you gotta just kind of put yourself in different places and then you sort of see which, which ones, you know, catch on. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I could give a, I could, I could give a few more if I had, you know, time to really to dive into this, but that's kind of my initial reaction is like, find the passion make sure you're really, really stoked on it and really love what you're doing. Um, and then just keep putting yourself out there. Keep, you know, exploring, asking for feedback beyond, you know, just your immediate friends and family. So get, and, and that's another thing too, is surround yourself with people that are better than you, which is a hard thing to do, but it's always beneficial. Surround yourself with people that are equally motivated. Cause like, if you're, you know, if, if your roommate just likes <laughs> sitting around watching TV all day, like you're probably going to get sucked into that. So, you know, you really want to surround yourself with people that are equally ambitious and that, you know, want are doing things. It doesn't have to be exactly what you're doing, but I, I found that's, that's an awesome way of, you know, just kind of creating like energy and, uh, and motivation. So that's a few a few things. I could I'll get carried away if I go any further. <laughs> also, great advice. I mean, they, yeah. that's what they say: is you 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 become who you surround yourself with. So, mm -hmm. um, so uh, how do people find you? How can they follow your work? Learn more about you? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. So, pretty much every channel is Alex Nye Art. So, my full name plus the word Art A L E X N Y E A R T. Uh, so that's alexnyart.com. Uh, at Alex Nyart on Instagram and pretty much all socials. I would say I'm most active on Instagram. Uh, my website is is kind of the more the home base, but but Instagram is where I kind of give most updates, stories. You know, I try to I try to post a lot of uh, behind the scenes of what you know what shoots I'm doing or what I'm up to, which is kind of fun. So appreciate you asking. Yeah, man. And uh, you're, you're always an inspiration to me and you kind of help motivate me and, and uh, get me to try new things and, and do things that I hadn't considered. And, and now I'm going to figure out how I can start reaching out to builders and uh, yeah. landscaping companies to try and license some of my work. So yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, it's been wonderful. And uh, yeah, I'd love to have you back. We'll get some uh, questions from our audience and uh, we'll di deep dive. And something we didn't even talk about is that you're also an American Ninja Warrior. I mean, <laughs> like that could be a whole episode of its own, but uh, yeah, but uh, but uh, we can talk about that next time more. But uh, for the audience, upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth will include more conversations with uh, creative professionals such as artists, photographers, woodworkers, glass blowers, UX designers, you name it. 
and more. If you have suggestions, uh, send them to wecreatetruth at gmail.com. Uh, please subscribe to us if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on your favorite podcast platform, leave us a good review. Uh, you can learn more at creative-truth.com. Thanks for listening.